The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to lecture number three. In the previous two lectures, we discussed some basic concepts related to finite element analysis. In this lecture, I would like to present to you a general formulation of the displacement-based finite element method. This is a very general formulation. We use it to analyze 1D, 2D, three-dimensional problems, plate and shell structures, and it provides the basis of almost all finite element analyses performed at present in practice. We will see that the formulation is really a modern application of the ritz galerkin procedures that we discussed in the last lecture. We will consider in this lecture static and dynamic conditions, but as I pointed out earlier, we will only be concerned with linear analysis. On this first view graph, I have prepared uh, schematically a sketch of a three-dimensional body. This three-dimensional body could represent typically a bridge, a shaft, a building, whatever structure we want to analyze. And this three-dimensional body here is subjected to the following forces. It is subjected to concentrated forces, forces that have components Fxi, Fyi, Fzi at point I, and there are many such points I. The body is also subjected to body force components, Fbx, Fby, Fbz. These are forces per unit volume. And we will see later on that we include in these forces the d'Alembert forces when we consider a dynamic analysis. The body is also subjected to surface forces, distributed surface forces, with components Fsx, Fsy, and Fsz. These surface forces would be, for example, distributed pressure, water pressure in a dam, frictional forces, etc. So we have basically concentrated surface forces. We have distributed surface forces and volume forces, externally applied volume forces, body forces. The body is, of course, also properly supported. We have here typically a support that prevents displacements in any direction. And here we have another such support. Here we have a roller support, which prevents displacements only in this direction. The body is defined in the coordinate system x, y, z. And notice that I'm using here capital x, y, z's. And the displacements of the body are measured as u, v and w into the capital X, Y and Z directions. I'm using capital uh, letters here to denote global displacements and global coordinates. We will later on in the fine element discretization also introduce small lowercase X, Y and Z's and U, V and W's to measure the displacements in the, in the individual elements. Well, so the problem is, in other words, that we have this body, this general structure, subjected to certain forces, properly constrained, and we want to calculate the displacements of the body, the strains in the body, and the stresses, of course, in the body. Well, on this view graph here, I listed the external forces once as vectors. Here is our uh, force Fb, the body force per unit volume with components into the x, y, and z directions. Here we have the surface forces with components in the x, y, and z directions. And here we have a typical concentrated force at point I with components Fx, Fy, and Fz again. The displacements of the body measured in the global coordinates are u, v, and w as shown here. Of course, notice that these u, v, and w's are functions of the capital X, Y, Z coordinates. The strains corresponding to these displacements, which are of course unknown, are listed here. And in a three-dimensional analysis, we have 
six such unknown strains from epsilon xx to gamma zx. Of course, the last three being the shearing strains and the first three being the normal strains. The corresponding stresses are listed here. Again, six components uh, from tau xx to tau zx. Of course, if we were to actually analyze a two-dimensional problem, such as a plane stress problem, we would only use the appropriate quantities from here and from there, as we will discuss later on. The starting point of our analysis, in which we want to calculate these stresses, these strains, and of course the displacements also, the starting point is the principle of virtual displacements. Now, this is the principle which we already discussed very briefly in the last lecture. Remember, please, that we can derive it by looking at the total potential of the system, which is given as the strain energy minus the potential of the external loads, W, U being the strain energy. If we invoke the stationarity of pi and we use the essential boundary conditions, which are the displacement boundary conditions, then we can derive the governing differential equations of equilibrium and the force boundary condition, the natural boundary conditions, as I have shown in the last lecture. Well, we will not derive these boundary conditions and the governing differential equations in this approach, but rather what we do is we invoke this principle, we set del pi equal to zero, and that gives us the principle of virtual displacements. And it is this principle which is the starting point of our finite element analysis. Let's recall once what does it mean. Well, here we have the body forces that are applied to the body, the surface forces that are applied to the body, these are externally applied loads, and concentrated forces that are also applied to the body at the uh, points I. These forces are in equilibrium with the stresses tau. Let's assume that we know the stresses at this point. Then the principle states the following. If we subject the body to any arbitrary virtual displacements listed in here, and I'm saying any arbitrary virtual displacements, that, sub, that however satisfy, excuse me, that however satisfy the essential boundary conditions, and that means just the displacement boundary conditions, then the work done by the loads, and that total work is given here. This is a virtual work because we are taking virtual displacements and subject the forces to, the vir to these virtual displacements. Then the external virtual work done is equal to the internal virtual work done, which is obtained by m multiplying the real stresses which are in equilibrium with these, sorry, with these externally applied forces, multiplying the real stresses by the virtual strains which correspond to the virtual displacements. So let me use here a different color. These virtual strains correspond to these virtual displacements, and of course, these virtual displacements over the body, these are of course a function of x, y, and z. These virtual displacements over the body give us also virtual displacements on the surface of the body, which are listed in here. So let us put a, another arrow in there. And these virtual displacements also give us concentrated virtual displacements at those points where we have concentrated loads applied. So once again, if we take the body and subject that body, who is in equilibrium under FB, FS, and FI with tau, tau being the real stresses, if we take that body and subject it to any arbitrary virtual displacement that satisfy the displacement boundary conditions, then the external virtual work is equal to the internal virtual work. The internal virtual work being obtained by taking the real stresses times the virtual strains, which correspond to the virtual displacements here, and integrating that product over the volume of the body. And the external virtual work is obtained by taking the real forces, multiplying these by the virtual displacements, 
and integrating these contributions over the complete body. Physically, what does this mean? Here we have again our general body. Let's see once pictorially what we are doing. Well, let's take a certain virtual displacement, which I depict here. Now, here we have a boundary condition. So this point P can only move over to there. It could not move this way because we have to satisfy in the virtual displacements the actual displacement boundary conditions. Here, the point cannot move at all, and here, this point can also not move. So a typical set of virtual displacements might look like that. Just sketched in here. This roller has moved over there. So there is our new roller, right there. Uh, what I satisfy are the, all the displacement conditions. Only horizontal movement was possible here. No movement here, no movement here. The virtual displacement vector here is that one, u bar, for a particular point. And that is the point that I'm looking at here. Then what the principle says once again is that if I take these virtual displacements, multiply them by the real forces, integrate that product over the total body, that is my external virtual work, and that external virtual work shall be equal to the internal virtual work which, which is obtained by taking the real stresses which are in equilibrium with these externally applied loads and multiplying these real stresses by the virtual strains that correspond to these virtual displacements and integrating that product as the internal virtual work over the whole body. This is an extremely powerful principle and an extremely important principle and provides the basis of our finite element formulation. In our finite element analysis, we are proceeding uh, in the following way. We say, well, let us idealize this complete body as an assemblage of elements. And what I've done here is to show, to draw one typical element. This is an eight-node element, a brick element, a distorted brick element, to make it a little bit more general. Uh, it's a eight-node element because we have four nodes on the top surface and four nodes at the bottom surface. There's another node here. This element here undergoes certain displacements, of course. And what I will be doing is I will express the displacements in that element as a function of the little coordinates system x, y, and z the displacement in the element being lower u, v, and w. If we idealize the total body as an assemblage of such elements, in other words, there's another element coming in from the top, another element coming in from the sides, from the four sides, and another element coming in from the bottom. So if we idealize the total body as an assemblage of such brick elements that lie next to each other, uh, etc., and we express the displacement in each of these brick elements as a function of the nodal point displacements, of the displacements of the corners of the bricks, then we can, of course, express the total displacements in the body as a function of the nodal point displacements. And that is the important step in the finite element analysis, that the displacements in each of these subdomains or elements are expressed in terms of nodal point displacements, these corner nodes as shown here for the brick element. And then, since the total body is made up of an assemblage of such brick elements, we can express the total displacements in the body as a function of these nodal point displacements and invoke the principle of virtual displacements. Now let's go into the actual specifics. Well. For element m, this might be element 10, m in that case would be equal to 10, we have the following relationship. And this is the important assumption of the finite element discretization. We say that the displacements, there are three, core, three displacements, u, v, and w, of course, now. For element m, u, v, and w listed in this vector u are equal to a displacement interpolation matrix hm, which is a function of x, y, and z times the nodal point displacements. And what I'm listing in this u hat vector are all the nodal point displacements 
that occur in the finite element discretization. For this brick element here, we have eight nodes, hence 24 nodal point displacements. At each node, we have u, v, and w. But notice, once again, there are other brick elements on top of it, on the sides, and below of it. And each of these brick elements, of course, has a set of such displacement, nodal point displacements. We notice, however, that the element below it here, if I take my pen here and draw in another element, we notice that that element has the same node as the top element. In other words, this node here is common to this top element and the bottom element. And that's where we have the coupling between elements. Uh, we will see that uh, more distinctly later. So what I'm doing here is I express the displacements in element M as a function of the, all the nodal point displacements. Uh, I'm listing here in U hat these displacements for N capital N nodal points we have this vector. Now in general later on we will simply call all of these components UIs and so our U hat here will be written in this way. Notice I use the transpose, the capital T here, to denote the transpose of a vector. So this UN here, this UN, is equal to that W capital, capital N. That's just for ease of notation. This is our major assumption. This is the major assumption in the fine element analysis. We will have to define for each element this displacement interpolation matrix. We notice that when we define it, there will be many columns that are simply zeros because only certain displacements in this vector, listed here, in this vector, really affect the displacements in an element. In other words, typically for this uh, element here, if we look at this node, then the displacements at this node will not affect, do not affect the displacements in this element because this node does not belong to the element. Uh, that is recognized by the fact that in this HM matrix there will be many uh, columns that are simply zeros. In fact, the only non-zero columns in this HM matrix are those that correspond to nodal points in this vector or nodal point displacements in this vector that belong to element M. Well, having laid down this assumption, and we will define once again later on the HM matrix for specific elements, 1D, 2D, 3D elements, and so on. Having laid down this assumption, we can derive the strains. And the strains are simply given by this relationship, where the BM matrix is the strain interpolation matrix of element M. Notice that the rows in this matrix are obtained by using the rows in the HM and differentiating these rows and combining these rows in the appropriate way. I'll show examples later on. There is no more assumption in this step. This BM matrix is simply obtained from the HM matrix by recognizing what strains we are talking about and by recognizing that we can simply use the rows here, differentiate them, linear, linearly combine them if necessary, to obtain the BM matrix. Of course, we also have to use our stress-strain law to obtain stresses from the strains. And the stresses in element M are given as shown here. These are the strains that I talked about here already. This is our stress-strain law, which can vary from element to element. I also introduce here an initial stress, uh, which might already be in the body. This might be due to overburden pressure, in an underground structure, as an example, and so on. So this is our stress-strain law, which we have to satisfy for the body, of course. Our compatibility conditions in the analysis will also be satisfied. The strain compatibility conditions are satisfied because we are deriving the strains from continuous displacements and within the element. And we will be also deriving the uh, we, we impose onto the different elements that they remain compatible under deformations. By that I mean if we have an element coming in here and another element going out there, that the elements underloading 
when the top element here and the bottom element, both of them are loaded, no gap is opening up here. So that compatibility, displacement compatibility between the elements is satisfied. So if we look at the three conditions that we have to satisfy in, in an analysis, the first one being the stress-strain law. That is satisfied because we are using this equation. The second by one being compatibility. That is satisfied because we're using this relationship here to calculate uh, our strains from the HM via the BM matrix. And we are satisfying, of course, that the elements remain together, so no gaps opening up. We will be talking about that later on when we talk about the convergence requirements also of finite element analysis. And finally, our equilibrium condition has to be satisfied. That is the third condition. Well, that equilibrium condition is embodied in the principle of virtual work. Here, I have it once again written down. The equilibrium conditions are in this principle of virtual work. Uh, and as I stated earlier, that if this equation is satisfied for any and all arbitrary virtual displacements that satisfy the displacement boundary conditions, the real displacement boundary conditions, then tau is equal is in equilibrium with FB, FS, and FI. Well, what we will be doing is we will be applying this principle of virtual displacements for our finite element discretization, which means that in an integral sense, we satisfy equilibrium. However, if we look into an element, then within the element, we will only satisfy the differential equations of equilibrium in an approximate way. We will not satisfy them exactly. However, if we, sa if we have a proper finite element discretization, and by that I mean if we satisfy all the convergence requirements that have to be satisfied uh, in order to obtain a valid solution or a reliable solution in a finite element analysis, then we know that as our elements become smaller and smaller and smaller, we will be finally and always, of course, applying the principle of virtual displacements, we will be finally satisfying also the differential equations of equilibrium locally within each element. So stress-strain law is satisfied. Compatibility is satisfied, both of them exactly. The equilibrium requirements are only satisfied in an integral sense if we have a coarse finite element mesh. But as the finite elements become more and more, as we refine our finite element mesh, we will be satisfying the equilibrium requirements also locally within an element, uh, always closer and closer. Uh, and uh, we will be approximating, or we will be getting closer to the satisfaction of the differential equation of equilibrium. Uh, <coughs> the first step now is to rewrite this principle of virtual displacements as in this form, namely as a sum of integrations over the elements. Uh, there's no assumption yet. All I've done is, since our total body is idealized as, an, as, sum, as a sum of uh, volumes, namely the volumes over the elements, I can rewrite the total integral as a sum over uh, the element integrals. And that's what I have done here. Notice we have now here m, denoting element m, and we are summing over all the elements. There's no assumption here yet. Now, however, I can substitute our assumption. Namely, that um is given in this way, and epsilon m is given that way. Once again, this is actually not an assumption. This is the major assumption that epsilon m follows from this assumption. It, this equation follows from that equation entirely. Substituting now from here these equations into the principle of virtual displacements, uh, we directly obtain the following equations. Here I have. On the left-hand side, let's go through this equation in detail. On the left-hand side, I have the following uh, part. I have an integral over all of the elements. That is the integral here. Uh, summing over element m and integrating over each of the element. This part here, bm transposed times u hat t is equal to the epsilon bar mt. So notice that our epsilon bar m, this is a virtual strain, is given in this way. Uh, before, I talked only about the real strains. 
In other words, the bar was not there. I put that now into brackets here. This bar was not there. Well, what we are doing in the finite element analysis is to use the same assumption for the virtual strains as we use for the real strains. In other words, we use this equation without the bar and with the bar on top of the epsilon and on top of the u hat. Uh, so here we have our epsilon bar transposed. This part here is the stress tau m equals cm epsilon m. Cm, that is our cm, the bm here comes in from the epsilon m. Uh, so bm times u hat is equal to epsilon m, once written down again here. And so this total part here is nothing else than, let's go back once more to the previous view graph, it's nothing else than this part here, than that part there, but with the initial stress, tau i, m, being on the right-hand side. Since we do know the initial stress, we put that one, of course, on the right-hand side. It is a load contribution. And here you see it. Here you see it. It's a minus sign because we put it on the right-hand side. And this part here, this part times this u hat, notice there's a big bracket here, a big bracket. Um, that u hat bar here uh, operating on that BM transposed, there's a transpose here too, gives us again the epsilon bar M transposed. So let us look now at what we have on the right hand side. On the right hand side, I want to d have discretized this part here. Well, what we do is we substitute here from our displacement interpolation, here from our displacement interpolation, and uh, each of these integrals can directly then be expressed in terms of the nodal point displacements. And that's what we have done here. The hm times the u hat bar is the u bar m transposed. Here we have the uh, u bar s, the u bar s, that is the u uh, hat bar times the hsm. Notice that this part here should not have been written that far. In other words, there's the end, the u bar s m transposed only goes up to there and it embodies this h s m transposed and the u hat bar transposed. Uh, this part we talked about already. So what we have done then is to rewrite, this is the important part, is to rewrite this principle of virtual displacements in which we had no assumption yet. We, have, we rewrote this in terms of the nodal point displacements and element interpolation matrices that we use for our finite element discretization. Now we, of course, have the assumption that the displacements when is within each element are given by the HM matrix. The strains are given by the BM matrix. So this is the result uh, that we have obtained. And at this point, we now invoke the principle of virtual displacements. Since this principle here shall hold for any arbitrary virtual displacement, very, uh, virtual displacements that satisfy dis the displacement boundary conditions, we can now invoke this principle n times. And by that I mean once by imposing a unit displacement at the first displacement degree of freedom and leaving all the others zero, Second time around, imposing a unit displacement at the second degree of freedom, all the others being zero. Third time around, imposing a unit displacement at the third degree of freedom, all the other di displacements being zero, and so on. And that really amounts to then saying that this vector here becomes an identity matrix, an identity matrix. And similarly, this one here becomes an identity matrix. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, we can take those two out, and our resulting equation then is simply what we have left, taking these two identity matrices out, and that is our finite element equilibrium equation, or I should rather say these are n finite element equilibrium equations, namely corresponding to the n nodal point displacements that we are considering. Uh, in general, what one does most effectively is to really derive these corresponding to all displacements, uh, having removed the boundary uh, conditions, and 
Then, later on, one imposes the boundary displacements, the known boundary displacements. And that's uh, uh, what I want to discuss a little bit later in more detail. So this is the result then that we obtained. And we obtain really in shorthand KU equals R, where K is this matrix. It's the structural stiffness matrix. Notice that I'm summing here over the elements, over the elements, this being here the element stiffness matrix. Notice that this element stiffness matrix here is an n by n matrix, has the same order as this k matrix. Uh, however, we will recognize that a large number of columns and rows in this matrix are simply zero. In fact, all those columns and rows are zeros, are filled with zeros that do not correspond to a nodal point displacement degree of freedom of element m. Uh, we, I show you later on some examples. Uh, however, by using this bm here and making this the same, this matrix, the element stiffness matrix, of the same order as this total structural stiffness matrix, we can directly sum over all the element stiffness matrices. And that, of course, is our direct stiffness procedure, which already I uh, pointed out to you earlier. Uh, the direct stiffness procedure means that we are adding the element stiffness matrices into the total stiffness matrix via this uh, summation here. So the Km here being what I have here in the blue brackets must be, of course, of the same order as K in order to be able to do that uh, theoretically, at least. Later on, we will see that we indeed only work with the non-zero rows and columns in the K matrix, and uh, uh, then use connectivity arrays to assemble Km effectively into the actual K matrix. For the RB vector, we have this part. Once again, we're using the direct stiffness procedure to add the contributions of all the elements in order to obtain the total RB vector. Once again, uh, the rows now, the rows, or rather the elements, because this, of course, is a vector here of n long now, those elements that do not correspond to nodal point degrees of freedom will all be zeros. Uh, <coughs> the RS vector similarly is obtained as shown here. Now we, of course, sum the element contributions as they arise from the surface forces and the Ri uh, vector is obtained as shown here. And the concentrated load vector is simply uh, a vector listing all the con concentrated forces in F. Uh, notice that this HSM matrix here is directly obtained from this HM matrix. Uh, sometimes one has difficulties visualizing what this matrix really is. Well, we will see later on if, if this is an element here and our coordinate system, say, lies in that element this way, then the HM matrix, of course, gives us the displacements within the element, whereas the HSM matrix gives us, say, the displacements on this surface of the element if, if it is that surface that we want to consider. Now, to get the displacements on the surface of the element when we know the displacements within the total volume of the element, uh, well, what we simply have to do is we have to substitute the coordinates of the surface in the HM here to obtain the HSM. Uh, I sh will show you later on some examples. Now, in dynamic analysis, of course, the loads are time dependent. And uh, if uh, we are considering a truly dynamic analysis, then we have to include inertia forces. And the inertia forces can directly be taken care of or can directly be included in the analysis if we use the d'Alembert principle. Uh, here we have the body loads, which are the uh, externally applied forces per unit volume. And if we split these up into those forces that are externally applied and those that are arising due to the d'Alembert forces, as shown here, then we directly have the inertia effect in the analysis. We now can, of course, express our 
uh, accelerations in the element in terms of nodal point accelerations again. And we are using here the same HM matrix, the same HM matrix that we used already for the displacement interpolations. If we substitute from here in, and, and here into the RB, which I had uh, written down here, we substitute into this RB here, this equation 4FB, then we directly can write down this equation here, MU double dot plus KU equals R, where the M matrix now is obtained as shown here. Notice that this R vector now only contains this RB part, in other words, not anymore the, F, the FB here, but rather an FB curl, an FB curl. Notice also that in this analysis now, or in this view graph, I've dropped the hat on the U. These are the nodal point displacements. These are the nodal point accelerations. I've dropped the hat just for convenience. I had already dropped it actually here also. Uh, we earlier had the hat there. Uh, here we had the hat still uh, because I wanted to distinguish the actual nodal point displacements from the continuous displacements in the uh, structure or in the body. So here the hat still being there, and here I dropped the hat already uh, just for convenience of writing. And from now on, when we have this vector, u here, then that means that we are talking about the concentrated nodal point displacements, or the actual nodal point displacements of the finite element mesh. Uh, I mentioned earlier that it is most convenient to include in the formulation all of the nodal point displacements, including those uh, that, are actually, that actually might be zero. In other words, for our three-dimensional body, to make a quick sketch here, if we have here our support in an actual analysis, it is most effective to say, well, let us remove the support and assign a node there with three unknown displacements. Once we have derived these equations of equilibrium, of course, we now will have to impose the fact that the displacements are zero there. And that is then done effectively, for example, as shown here. We have here the general equations, m u double dot plus k u equals r. And what we are doing is we are listing the displacements and accelerations into vectors uh, u double dot a, uh, u a, and u double dot b, and u b, where the b components, the b components of the displacements and accelerations are known. Uh, now, they might be zero, as I showed here in this particular example, or they might be uh, actual values that we want to impose. If they are known, well, we can look at the first equation, as shown here and put all the known quantities on the right-hand side, substitute for u, b, and u double dot b, and we know then the right-hand side load vector. Thus, we can calculate u, a, and u double dot a. Having now calculated the velocities, the accelerations and displacements, we can go back and get the reactions. The reactions, of course, being r, b. Uh, here, I assumed that the displacements which we are talking about in the vector here are actually the ones that we also want, might want to impose. Well, in some cases, of course, we might have defined in our finite element formulations the u and v displacement, as shown here. But a displacement that we want to impose is actually this one here, namely that one might have to be restrained, and this one here might have to be free. In that case, if our finite element formulation has used the u and v displacements, we have to make a transformation, as shown here, a well-known transformation from the uh, u uh, to the u bar displacements. And uh, this, in a more general sense, is written down here once again. When we have many more degrees of freedom, our T uh, matrix would look as shown here. It's an identity matrix with the little transformation matrix that I have shown here, the cosine, minus sine, sine, cosine matrix now put into the appropriate rows and column. The i's column, j's column, i's row, and j's 
row would carry these uh, uh, two by two matrix, and otherwise we just have ones on the diagonal. So this is the more general transformation that we are using when we have many more degrees of freedom than just the two that we want to modify. Uh, substituting from here into our uh, equations of equilibrium, mu double dot plus ku equals r, uh, we directly obtain this equation where m bar now is shown as shown here, k bar is as shown here, and r bar is as shown here. Uh, let me mention here that this looks like a formal matrix multiplication. In fact, two formal matrix multiplications, m times t, and then the product should be taken uh, times t transpose, pre-multiplied by t transpose. Well, in actuality, of course, <coughs> all we need to do is combine rows and columns the i's and j's, rows and columns, to obtain directly our m bar matrix. Similarly for the k bar and the r bar uh, matrices. Another procedure that is also used in practice, can be very effective, is uh, an application of the penalty method. In this procedure, we impose basically a spring, physically a spring, of very large stiffness, uh, k where k is much larger than k bar ii. And then we supplement our basic equations. We supplement our basic equations that are shown here by, uh, the, by this equation here. So if k, this k, is much larger than k bar ii, and if we supplement this equation or add this equation into this equation here, then we notice that the spring stiffness will wipe out basically the other stiffnesses that come into this degree of freedom. And our solution will simply be that ui is equal to b, which is the one that we want. So this penalty method can be used uh, to impose displacement degrees of freedom. Uh, and it really physically amounts to adding a spring into the degree of freedom where we want to impose a certain displacement. And it's important, however, that if we use that method, that we are always dealing with single degree of freedoms being imposed. And by that, I mean the following. If we had a system like this one here, and our displacement, original displacement degrees of freedom are these, then we first have to make the transformation onto that fine element system to these degrees of freedom here. And now we add our spring in. In other words, we want to add our spring into, into this system of equations, because now there is no coupling from, uh, deg from this degree of freedom that we want to impose into other degrees of freedom through that spring. The spring only enters on the diagonal, and now it is a numerically stable process. Stable process. However, if we do, were not to perform this transformation, in other words, if we were still to deal with these degrees of freedom and then add our spring in, of course, that spring now would introduce coupling between these two degrees of freedom and numerical difficulties may arise in the uh, solution. Uh, so basically then, in summary, if we do have degrees of freedom to be imposed, uh, we first go through this transformation to obtain uh, the um, m bar u double dot bar k bar u bar equals r bar system of equations where the displacements that we're talking about are containing those displacements that we actually want to impose. We then can impose these displacements using the penalty method, which is this one, or we can impose these displacements using the uh, more conventional procedure uh, using, in other words, simply this procedure of imposing ub uh, and rewriting the equations into those, into two equations. In the first equation uh, we solve for the ua now. Of course, in this particular case, we would now have our bars on there. And if we have done a transformation, and in the second equation, then we obtain the reactions. Uh, let me now go through a simple example to show you the application of what I have discussed. Um, this is 
a very simple example, but a very illustrative example. Uh, in particular, it is also the example that we talked about already earlier in lecture two, when we did a Ritz analysis on this problem. Uh, in fact, our finite element analysis that we are now pursuing using the general equations that I presented to you is really nothing else than a Ritz analysis. And in fact, if you look at the earlier solutions that we obtained, solution two corresponds to the, in the Ritz analysis, corresponds to the finite element solution that I will be discussing with you now. So here is the problem once again. We have a bar of, u of unit area from here to there, and then of changing area uh, from here to there. The length here is 100, the length here is 80. The bar in actuality is supported here, but as I mentioned earlier, we remove that support in our finite element formulation and introduce, in fact, a displacement degree of freedom there. So here I want to put down a first node. Now, the first step in any finite element analysis must, of course, be uh, the step of idealizing the total structure as an assemblage of elements. And there are generally choices, how many elements to take, what type of element to take, and so on. In this particular case, I uh, know that there is a discontinuity in area here, and uh, for that reason, intuitively, I will put one element from here to there with a constant area. Also, let us consider for the moment this also as being one element, and this then will correspond to the Ritz analysis that we performed earlier. Uh, notice that we have here a bar of unit area, a bar of changing area. This total bar assemblage is subjected to a load of 100, a concentrated load of 100, as shown here. The only strains that this bar can develop are normal strains. In other words, if a section originally uh, is here, that section will move over a certain amount and that by that amount. That is u. In the coordinate system that we are using, the y coordinate being in this direction, this is the y coordinate here, this would be our u of y. However, since we are dealing with two elements to analyze this bar, what I will do is I will introduce a little coordinate system here. And uh, I used little y in this particular case. So we put a little y here. There's also, for this element, a little y. And the area in this particular element here, let me write that down also, the area is given as 1 plus y divided by 40 squared. So this is the changing area in this domain. However, also, remember please, if in our analysis, if an original section in this area was vertical like that, after deformations due to the load here, it will still be vertical. And now our displacements in this element will also be given by a u. And that u is a function of, if we look at this little y, if we use that little y, of that y as <coughs> this u here is a function of this y. This y corresponds to the y in this element. That y corresponds to the y in this element. Uh, because we use different coordinate systems for each element. Now, this is actually an important point that we can use for each element a different coordinate system. We could use. Cartesian coordinate systems for each element, different ones. Uh, in fact, that is most generally done. Uh, if we have uh, specific geometries, we might use cylindrical coordinate systems for certain elements, Cartesian coordinate systems for other elements, and so on. This is an extremely important point that we can have different coordinate systems for different elements, because that eases the f calculation of the element stiffness matrices. So, here our element 1, here our element 2. Uh, and uh, the displacements that we are talking about are u1 at this node, u2 at this node, u3 at that node. These three displacements shall give us the displacement distributions, of course only an approximate displacement distribution, 
in the complete element mesh. Two elements make up our element, uh, complete element idealization, our complete element mesh. Well, the equation that, of course, I will now be operating on is this one, KU equals R. In this particular case, we recognize that we want to calculate our stiffness matrix, K. Here we have two elements, so M in this particular case will be equal 1 and 2. Uh, we don't have a body force vector, we don't have a surface force vector, we don't have an initial stress vector, however we have a concentrated load vector. So what I will want to do then is to calculate our K matrix and establish our concentrated load vector. The K matrix embodies the disp strain displacement interpolations, which are obtained from the element displacement interpolations. Now, as I already pointed out, we have now here two elements. The first element shown here, second element shown here. Uh, notice that the U1, U2 correspond to these T displacements, U1, U2. The U2, U3 correspond to these displacements, U2, U3. Notice that there is a coupling between the elements because U2 he is here a displacement of that element and is here the displacement of element 2. The length of the element 1 is 100, length of element 2 is 80. Well, if we have two displacements to describe the displacements in an element, then we recognize immediately that all we can do is have, all that we can have is a linear variation in displacement between the two endpoints, between these two nodes. And so the element displacement interpolations uh, must involve these functions. For a unit displacement at this end of an element, y over l is the uh, interpolation of the displacement. For a unit displacement at this end of the element, this is the interpolation. Notice that the actual displacement, of course, goes into this direction, but I'm plotting it upwards to show you uh, the magnitude of that displacement. If we have established these uh, interpolation functions, recognizing, of course, that for element 1, L is 100, for element 2, element is equal to L is equal to 80, then we can directly write down our H1 and H2 matrices. They are given as shown here. Notice that UM is equal to HMU, where U is equal to I write down the transpose U1, U2, U3. Uh, now we notice that for element 1, let's go back once more, for element 1, only U1 and U2 influence the displacements in that element. And that is given, shown here, U3, U3 has a zero and does not influence the displacement in the element. Uh, Similarly, for H2, U1 does not influence the displacement in that, in that element. So we have these displacements. Notice also that I have written here UM, of course, but that UM here, for our specific case, is simply this displacement VM. We have only one displacement component. Taking the derivative of these, um, of these relations here, we get directly the uh, strains. Notice that here we should have probably put an M there. Uh, this is the normal strain, the normal strain in the element, and we obtain these matrices by simply taking the derivatives. Well, now we have the components that we need to evaluate the K matrix, and as I mentioned earlier, that is the total K matrix is obtained by summing the contributions over the elements. This is coming from element one. This is from coming from element two. Notice that the area is one. Young's modulus is the stress strain law. We're integrating from zero to 100. This is here B1 transposed. That is B1. This is here B2 transposed. That is B2. This is the area that I uh, pointed out to you earlier. Uh, evaluating these two matrices, we directly obtain these matrices. And notice the following that there is no coupling from the third degree of freedom into element one. Similarly, there is no coupling from the first degree of freedom into element two. In fact, what we will do later on is 
simply calculate the non-zero parts. We call these the compacted element uh, stiffness matrices. And knowing these non-zero parts and knowing into which degrees of freedom they have to put in the assemblage phase to obtain the total stiffness matrix, we can directly assemble this stiffness matrix. In other words, if I know this part here and I know that the uh, first column corresponds to the first column of the global stiffness matrix, the second column corresponds to the second column in the global stiffness matrix, then I can just add this contribution into this part here. Similarly, I can simply add this contribution here into that part there uh, without carrying always these zeros along. And that is, of course, a very important computational aspect. However, in theory, uh, we are really still performing these additions as shown he here. We really still perform the additions as we uh, pointed them out in the direct stiffness procedure. In other words, we still perform this summation as I pointed it out to you earlier. The important point, however, is that we now have uh, established the K matrix corresponding to this system. Our R vector is simply, in this particular case, 0, 0, 100, uh, because we only have 100 applied at the third degree of freedom. We now have to impose that u1 is 0. We simply set u1 is equal to 0 in the equilibrium equations, as I pointed out earlier. We solve for u2 and u3. And having obtained u2 and u3, we know the displacements in each of these bars. And we know, uh, therefore, the strains and the stresses in each of these bars. Uh, the solution is plotted in uh, the example that I discussed with you in lecture 2. Uh, I, this example really showed some of the basic points of finite element analysis. Of course, we have to discuss much more how we actually obtain the HM matrices uh, for more complex, more complicated uh, elements that are used in actual practical analysis. However, this is all I wanted to mention in this lecture. Thank you for your attention.